Welcome to the Health Leader Forge, a joint production between the University of New Hampshire and the Northern New England Association of Healthcare Executives. My name is Mark Bonica, and I am an assistant professor in the University of New Hampshire's Department of Health Management and Policy. Today I'm joined by Sarah Elmendorf, a junior in the Department of Health Management and Policy, who was the guest host for this month's interview. Hi, Sarah. Hi. So who did you talk to? I spoke with my mom, Eileen Keefe, and she's the Chief Nursing Officer at Parkland Medical Center. So what were some of the highlights from the interview for you? It was really interesting for me to learn more about her early career before I was even born. And I found that I could relate to a lot of the things that she was talking about, being a young college student looking for a career in healthcare. And I was impressed learning about the complexities of her role now as the chief nursing officer. And it was helpful for me to talk a little bit more about that because I'm interested in a similar career path within nursing or healthcare management. Great. So nice job with the interview. It, uh, I, think it, I think you did a great job. And for those of you listening, uh, if you enjoy uh, Sarah and Eileen's conversation, won't you leave us feedback on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, or wherever you may be accessing this recording. It helps other people discover us. Thanks for listening. And here is Eileen Keefe. So welcome to the podcast, Mom. You attended Boston College and received a Bachelor of Science degree in nursing. Why did you choose to attend BC and what made you want to be a nurse? Thanks, Sarah. I'm so glad to have some time to sit down and chat with you about my career and sort of the decisions and, and choices that I made that, that led me to this spot. So yeah, going to BC was a, was a pretty big decision for me. I was very fortunate. My parents were big believers in education, especially education for women. My dad had five sisters. They all went to college. And in those days, that was pretty exceptional. And I knew I wanted to be a nurse. My mom was a nurse. I was, I was a helper. I enjoyed that, and uh, my mom was a graduate of a three-year diploma program. Those okay. are the old-fashioned uh, nurses train in the hospital types yeah. of programs. And um, she felt that I should go to a four-year program, and, and that's what I did. My dad was a big proponent of Jesuit education, and I had siblings that had gone to BC, and was just fortunate that that was the place that, that, I, could, that I could study nursing. So, like, what were the advantages of the, the four-year program versus the three-year? Well, I think, you know, at the time that I was, that I was choosing a nursing program, um, an associate degree was an option or a bachelor's degree. Yeah. There were some diploma programs. Those were the sort of the old-fashioned model of, of training, which trained highly technical and, and great nurses, but that had sort of fallen out of, out of favor. So... I could do a, an associate degree or a bachelor's degree. And again, coming from a family that really valued education, it, um, and my mom knew that I would have more um, career choices, and also yeah. they could support me to do a four-year program. So yeah. I, I don't want to disparage two-year nursing programs or associate degrees because they are phenomenal. Yeah. And a lot of the nurses we hire come through associate degree programs, but for me, I had an option to do a four-year program. I wasn't entirely sure that I wanted to be a nurse, so I got to take some other courses and, and really get a sense of whether that was going to be for me. So, And you mentioned the Jesuit Yeah, um, we have this joke um, about how my siblings make fun of me because on my college essay I wrote about how I wanted to study under the Jesuit umbrella, yeah. and, and they thought that was the most ridiculous thing they ever heard. But <laughs> it was very much in alignment with how I was raised, uh, Catholic, being for others. And um, the Jesuits are, are strong proponents of, of education, mm -hmm. and it was a nice and natural fit for me. I felt very much at home there. So after you graduated in 1987, where was your first job and how did you find it? So um, my first job was at Beth Israel. I was really fortunate. Back in the 80s, Beth Israel was one of the original magnet hospitals, um, a hospital where they had no trouble recruiting and retaining nurses and patients got great care. So my professors really um, talked that up with us. I also did clinicals there and at other great hospitals in Boston. And I knew I wanted to be in an academic environment. I loved learning. Beth Israel had this model of nursing called primary nursing, which was something they were pioneering. They had a great nurse leader, Joyce Clifford, 
who um, brought primary nursing to Beth Israel. And what that means is the nurse really was the, there was one nurse who was the primary designer of that patient's nursing care plan. So when a patient got admitted to a hospital, if they were a patient that had never been to our hospital before and I admitted them, I, I would have the opportunity to be their primary nurse, which means get a holistic sense of what's wrong with them and create a nursing care plan that's designed for them. And then every person that followed me would would follow that plan yes. and, and certainly add to that plan, but I was sort of the architect of that plan. And that was really cool. I think patients liked it, and it was funny. I'd be up on the floors, and I'd hear that my primary patient was back in the ER, and they were going to be readmitted or not be readmitted. But I think there was a sense of, um, of knowing that I think made people very comfortable. Yeah. And I loved that. Again, relationships, I, I liked it. Yeah. So what was it like from going from a nursing student to... A to uh, well, you know, <laughs> I... I I took my licensure exam, mm -hmm. and uh, my friends biked across the country. I stayed home and studied for yeah. my licensure exam. They still remind me about that. I, I probably, in retrospect, could have done both, but I was focused on getting my RN license, and then I was hired at BI. And I remember the big deal at Beth Israel was this competency-based orientation, which, which was reassuring to me. They said, don't worry. like You're going to have a preceptor, and everything you do we're going to make sure you're confident at before you start taking care of people. We sort of joke about it, but new nurses worry um, yeah. that they're going to hurt people. That's yeah. the biggest worry they have. Is And that can sort of get in the way of all the other stuff, making making um, connections with patients and families, being kind to yourself. So having a preceptor, having a competency-based orientation, and being in this great nursing environment was just was just a dream. So did you find yourself worried a lot as a new nurse? or? Yeah, I was. Enough worry that I kept myself on my game. So anxiety can be helpful. It didn't disable me, but it kept me on my game, kept me asking questions. And I had a preceptor who um, I connected really well with, and she was really supportive. And really the whole team. Nursing reminds me of teaching, and I say this to dad all the time, that there's a village around you when you're a nurse or a teacher, yeah. and you probably find that as faculty members that um, you support one another. And if you don't have the answers, you know where you can get them. Mm -hmm. And if there's something you need to know, the people around you are usually pretty good about telling you what that is. Yeah. So it was a great place to start at that career. So you started as a med surge nurse and then I did. you worked yep. in the ER? So yeah. what was that transition like? Well, it was it was fun. Um, med surge was a good place to start, for sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really um, was a good place to learn prioritization and organization. Of course, I worked at the A&P um, in grocery, and uh, I was always very process and efficiency oriented. Mm -hmm. But being a med surge nurse really helped me develop that even further. And um, I was on that unit for eight years, which okay. is a lifetime now when you think yeah. about a nurse being on a med surge unit for eight years. So lots of variety, tons of support for me. There were a lot of clinical specialists at BI in those days who would show up when I was having a bad day. I don't know how that happened. They'd just show up and, and help me through difficult situations. So the nursing um, support there was tremendous. Cool. I liked spending time with my patients on the unit. And then I, I decided I was ready for a change. And I, I looked around, and one, my boss at the time said, why don't you look around and see whose job you'd like to have and, and shadow and figure out if you want to do that. So I thought the ER would be good for me. I knew a lot of people that worked there. I liked the fast pace. Mm -hmm. um, and so I went from being a charge nurse and a leader on the med surge unit to being a novice all over again. Yeah. And that was uncomfortable and exciting at the same time. I liked the unpredictability. I liked the pace, the need to establish trust quickly, the need to size things up quickly, um, work with providers and, and specialists in a different way than I did as a med surge nurse. I'll always remember um, one of my first days down in the ER calling a doctor. Um, and in, in the ER, I, my knowledge base was pretty small. And having to call a doctor about a question as a nurse sometimes can be can be daunting. Yeah. And uh, 
I called the doc and I think the fact that I was calling from the ER gave me some cachet mm -hmm. that I didn't have as a med surge <laughs> nurse and it sort of annoyed me because I thought, you know what, I know less now than I did yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, those are some of my early memories about being mm -hmm. an ER nurse. So how long did you do that for? I did that for eight years. And then? So I did about eight years of each. Okay. And then... Um, you know, Dad was working up here in New Hampshire. Yeah. We had two little kids, and we had to make a decision about whether it was really appropriate for us to be driving all over the place to get to work and who was going to be around for our kids. And Dad used to joke with me, Eileen, there's health care in New Hampshire, too. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I had been at BI for my whole career, and yeah. I loved it there. Um, so I started to look around, and just out of the blue, I got a call from a nurse um, Denise, who called me and said, hey, you know, there's an educator job at this little hospital in New Hampshire, and I wonder if you would consider it. And I was just like, oh. So I wasn't looking, and it's really yeah. funny. A lot of my staff will say that to me. I wasn't looking, but things popped up. And mm -hmm. so I came in, and I interviewed for the position, not really thinking whether I wanted it or not. I didn't prepare well for the interview. Really? I think I thought I had the job. Oh. And I didn't get the job. Um, so it was a med surge educator job. And I thought, wow, I really wanted that job. Oh, I didn't So know um, I called the CNO back the next day. And I said, you know, I'm really disappointed. But I want to I understand from your perspective what mm -hmm. would have made me a candidate for that position. Because I, I really think I could have done a better job convincing you. And she said, well, you know, it's funny that you should, you should call me. Because I have another educator position that just opened. So I came back in and I interviewed again. And I tell that story a lot because it just sort of illustrates how, you know, you, you just got to keep at things. And, and yeah, I've never heard you say that story. Yeah. So the first job was an ER educator and the second job was a med surge educator. So nice. Um, yeah. So that was in 2000. So at what point did you become a supervisor? Um, well, you know, from a supervisory perspective at BI, you know, there's there's the delegation working with, with um, nursing assistants and yeah. techs. Um, I had this this cool um, role at BI that I'm sure you don't know about, but we got this grant, this nursing grant, to study um, creating a, a, a special role, taking our techs. We had multiple different types of techs on this 46-bed unit, mm -hmm. taking the techs, some of them did food, some of them did housekeeping, some of them did transport, some of them did patient care. And we, we got this grant from Robert Wood Johnson to create this role that combined all those tech support roles mm -hmm. into one. And I got to help um, write the curriculum, interview the techs, and train cool. the techs to be, we called them support assistants. So um, that was me, that was my first leadership being responsible for people yeah. that I couldn't necessarily control <laughs> and yeah. figure out how to do that. And so that was really fun. Yeah. Um, so when you moved up to New Hampshire, you got your master's degree in clinical nurse leadership at UNH. Mm -hmm. What made you want to get your master's degree? And what made you want to go to UNH? Yeah, so um, when I got here, I knew I wanted to go back to school. I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do. It was helpful to take one class at a time. You mm -hmm. guys were little. Dad, Dad was always, always so supportive and, and making sure that I had the time that yeah. I needed to be successful with this. So I started with one class, and then next thing I knew, I was two or three classes in. I met faculty, so I met Jean Harkless. She made a profound impact on me. Yeah. And um, I realized that the work I was doing would benefit from me going back to school and learning more. Mm -hmm. And also that the environment I was in was a really rich environment for a student to be in too. Yeah. You know, I feel like there's so much learning um, and teaching happening, so I, I got excited about quality. Um, I think Jean fired that for me, Jean Harkless. Mm -hmm. I got to go up to Dartmouth for one of my last classes and, and um, was part of their clinical microsystem course, which is a big deal. They, it's a great course. Um, Paul Batalden and Jean Nelson and 
these great pioneers of, of healthcare quality. Yeah. And I learned a lot about leadership from them and about quality from them. And Gene helped make that happen. And the microsystem work really opened up the doors for me to how a nurse goes from being a bedside nurse to an educator to a quality leader and what that looks like. So your first role at Parkland was as an educator, mm -hmm. correct? Yep. So what kind of hospital is Parkland? And it's part of the larger corporation, HCA, if you want to yep. talk a little bit about what HCA is. Yeah, so we are an 86-bed community hospital. Mm -hmm. We're an acute care hospital, and we do we do all the things acute care hospitals do. We have a we have an OR. We have a I mentioned we have a cath lab. Mm -hmm. We do um, primary um, PCI. We're a certified stroke center. We have an ER. We deliver babies. Um, what am I missing? We have a lot of outpatient programs: oncology, urology, cardiology, behavioral health was mm -hmm. the most recent service we added about four or five years ago, inpatient and outpatient behavioral health. And um, we are a community hospital that is tied to a large corporate entity. So um, what that means is a lot of our, um, a lot of our leadership comes from a, from a corporate level. Mm -hmm. uh, what does that mean? We have access to capital. We have access to data. We have, um, we align our strategic priorities with HCA's strategic priorities, which um, is basically about quality. Um, the HCA mission statement is, above all else, we are committed to the care and improvement of human life. And that's our hospital mission statement as well. So one of the things I remember when I came here was how engaged the senior leadership team was in quality. Mm -hmm. Because in the world I came from, quality sort of lived with the clinicians and in this world, quality is everybody's job and everybody's engaged in quality and supporting quality. So that was, that was game changing for me, right? To go from Beth Israel, which is this philanthropic nonprofit entity yeah. where patient-centeredness was, was, and mission was very strong to an entity like this where um, I was in the community. And I remember thinking, oh, People here are just like the people that I took care of in Boston. Yeah. <laughs> There's nothing magical about being in the community. Yeah. And um, I found that the nurses were, they didn't have residents, they didn't have interns. Mm -hmm. They were great nurses. They had to think on their feet. They had to manage difficult situations um, without all that support. So that was, that was my, that's sort of my, my transition here. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned the coming from a nonprofit hospital and now working at a for-profit hospital. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the differences with that, if there are any that you've noticed? Yeah. So, you know, I think about the main differences are probably tax and accounting. Um, we talked yeah. about that a little bit earlier. We're a tax-paying entity. You know, I think at the end of the day, I know at the end of the day, every hospital has a budget. Every hospital has operational imperatives and efficiencies that 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 keep them keep their doors open, yeah. <laughs> keep them sustainable. So, what we do is is just slightly different in terms of the accounting and the and the taxes. But we're here to take care of patients, and I think if you talk to nurses here. I don't think any of them would say they notice a difference. Um, mm -hmm. Patients are patients and nurses want to give great care. Yeah. So my job is to make sure they can do that. You know, there's a lot of benefits to being part of a large organization. Um, there's efficiencies, there's economies, there's mm -hmm. sharing of best practices. You know, as much as I love data, I love looking at other people's best practices. So if we're trying to figure out how to get something done, I can usually pick up the phone and, and figure out who's doing that well and how are you guys doing that? So mm -hmm. that's another big um, positive for being part of a large entity. And who are HCA's major competitors? You know, I think I can't really speak for the enterprise and the competitors. Um, as your students know, um, healthcare is evolving rapidly. Yep. Um, the way people think about healthcare and receive healthcare continues to evolve. 
our goal here at Parkland is to meet the needs of this community, um, to hire and retain great staff, uh, to partner, as we talked about this morning, with relevant partners and providers and offer services that people can receive right here um, and offer the best care and the best care experience that they can get. So um, lots of good examples of that. One of them that comes to mind is we noticed a lot of women were leaving this community for breast care. Mm -hmm. And we said, you know, that's, that's silly. Um, we have a wonderful oncology program with Leahy. We yeah. give great oncologic care here um, from a nursing and provider perspective, but um, people want to find a breast specialist. So what we did was we reached out to the primary care practices in the area and we said, where are your patients going? What do you think about that? And they said, yeah, we totally agree. You know, women ought to be able to stay in this community and get yeah. board certified breast care. So we worked with um, the primary care, with Leahy, with Dartmouth and others to figure out how can we make that happen? And now we have Dr. Julie O'Brien, who's a board certified um, breast surgeon here. And um, women don't have to leave the community for great care. So that's one example of how we partner. So you mentioned how um, healthcare has evolved since you started in the field. Do you have any examples or how, has, how your role in nursing has changed since you started? Yeah, so, you know, healthcare evolving. I think when I think back to when I first started in quality, you know, all the things that we said, be careful what you wish for, um, things like patients having ownership and accountability around their care. Price transparency is another good example of that, yeah. right? Everybody said, oh, we need price transparency in healthcare. It's hard to understand what things cost in healthcare because of the way insurance contracts happen. But mm -hmm. in general, um, I think consumers are more price conscious because they're on the they're on the hook for their care at a higher level. I think that's one. Um, I think expectations are high. Mm -hmm. I I heard somewhere that New Hampshire is the second oldest state in the union. So I think the aging population, chronic illness, so people yeah. living longer with chronic disease, has added um, a perspective to the care we provide. You know, I think hospitals are merging and consolidating, looking for ways to become more efficient. I think there's some value to organizations doing that, eliminating redundancies and filling gaps in care. So when you started at Parkland, you sort of moved away from the hands-on clinical work. Did you miss that at all, the direct patient contact or...? Yeah, I mean, I did. It was a big, um, it was a big deal for me to, to, um, to be steps away from the bedside versus the person at the bedside, and I had to sort of come to some. I had to work through that. And as a as an educator, it was that was a natural role for me to to try to do that, right? Yeah. So instead of putting that IV in, I'm going to teach you how to put an IV mm -hmm. in, and and um, instead of you know being the hero, I'm going to help you be the hero. So yeah. that's sort of how I approached that. And it was fun. I realized I liked, um, I liked that part of it. I always liked working with students when I was a nurse at the bedside. So, and as you can see, I'm really close to the bedside here. Yeah. I know a lot about our patients. Um, I know a lot about their stories and what our staff is doing to take great care of them. So I'm pretty close to the bedside. And you also talked about um, how a lot of hospitals are joining together and making larger systems mm -hmm. as healthcare evolves. Do you think that this is going to become more prominent in the future? Or? You know, it seems like that's where things are headed. I think, as I said, for consolidation, for efficiencies. I think there's a lot of other disruptive things happening on the margins that I can't even speak to. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, there's there's lots of lots of change happening that I think is going to be disruptive and what that's going to look like, I'm not sure. What are some of the advantages to that? Like Parkland being part of HCA, what are some of the advantages? Yeah, so I mentioned, you know, access to funding, access to best practices, access mm -hmm. to great leaders. You know, yeah. I've I've benefited from some great um, leader colleagues and CEOs and others. You know, I report to a division leader who reports to a corporate CNO, and 
I benefit from a lot of the, the guidance and networking with them. Mm -hmm. And then um, Anne, Anne was our CEO back in yep. you know, the years where I was going back to school, thinking about what my next degree should be. And mm -hmm. she was a big proponent of the master's in nursing. So sure. a lot of my... So Anne... Anne Jamison. Okay. Yeah, a lot of my colleagues were, were going on and getting MBAs, and, and she said, Eileen, you're a nurse at heart and a nurse leader, so a master's in nursing makes a lot of sense for you. And so it was just good to get that reaffirmed. So after you got your master's, what position were you in at Parkland? I think while I was in the program, I was moving from an educator, director of the education department, to... Um, the VP of quality. So while I was while I was getting my master's, I was um, learning about quality and risk and safety. And uh, one of my mentors during that time was the quality VP Scott Goodwin. He ended up going to another facility um, about six months to a year after I graduated. But he was a real mentor for me. And so when I was in school, learning things that nobody around me seemed to be terribly interested in, um, it, it seemed to me. I'd talk to Scott about what I was learning and how I could use what I was learning. And then when he left, it was a nice opportunity for me to consider the role and interview for the role and, um, and get that job. So, so talking about mentors, mm -hmm. you just mentioned how they've had a big impact in your career. Have you mentored any people in the past? And what do you think would make a good mentor? Yeah, I have done a lot of mentoring. Um, you know, I think I think nursing, as I said earlier, is sort of a, a, a team sport. From my first preceptors to, to other people that I've worked with over the years, I've, I've learned from all of them. Some have been formal and informal mentors have been out there as well. So, yeah. you know, Ian Jameson was a good example of that. Someone who saw something in me that I didn't quite yet see in myself. Mm -hmm. And someone that encouraged me, that was Scott when I was learning about clinical microsystems, how could I apply that here in a way that people could understand it yeah. and, and could engage with it. So I, about six months ago, volunteered with the American Nurses Association to be a mentor. And uh, I do a coaching call every month with a nurse who works at another facility oh, okay. in, in New Hampshire. And I just put myself out there for her. I listen to her. I answer questions she might have about her career. Mostly, I try to do what I learned from other mentors, which is ask good questions and listen. Yeah. And try not to tell her what to do, try to uncover you know, what, what she's looking for and try to help her get there. I think other things that mentors do well is, is, is help you network and make connections. And you and I have talked about this. When when people introduce you to other people, there's a familiarity there. Yeah. So, you know, it's not cheating to say, hey, you know, my mom wants to talk to, you know, uh, my mom will talk to you about your nursing career and where mm -hmm. you could go with that. Mm -hmm. I find that when I make introductions, I'm doing it because this is someone that has, um, shares values and ethics that I think this person would find helpful. So... You know, the long and short of it is some people think that that's, that that's sort of cheating. I, I think people, I think relationships and networking are important. And if you can introduce your students and your mentees to people that can help them, that's really valuable. Yeah. And you must enjoy that because you mentioned I do. that you, I nursing do. and teaching is sort of your realm. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, so talking to your friends about what they want to do, like yeah. yesterday, sitting around getting the updates of what classes are you taking next semester and what do you think you want to do, and yep. I enjoy that very much. So at what point did you think about becoming the CNO here at Parkland? So, you know, another just sort of good natural progression. I was never good at that where do you see yourself in three years, five years, ten years question. Some people are really good at that question. Yeah. I always loved what I was doing at the time. And, um, you know, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I don't judge that. But I was in a position where the, the CNO that was here at the time was getting ready to move on. And she said, Eileen, you're going to be my succession plan. 
And that's one of the things that we do talk a lot about here is succession planning. So, and I'm really proud of that. And I'm, I'm a part of that. So rather than me, um, you know, look elsewhere or a good nurse here, look elsewhere. I want to say, what's your next job and how can I help you get there? So Mm -hmm. Brenda did that for me. She said, you can do this job. And I said, I don't think I can do that. Who is Brenda? Brenda Simpson. She was, she was the CNO at the time. Oh, okay. So she mentored me. She coached me. She taught me. She had been through a CNO development program. She shared a lot of that work with me. And, um, I appreciated that. And so when the position opened, um, I interviewed with the team. I think Anne had left by that time, and it was just a good opportunity for me. So what, were some, what are some of the things that you oversee as the chief nursing officer? So all of nursing has to report to me, okay. either directly or indirectly. Um, so um, ED, OR, um, Women and Children's Services, Adult and Critical Care, report directly to me, okay. as well as um, clinical informatics, nursing informatics, and um, quality and safety. Mm-hmm. And then I, I co-manage with Mark, our VP of Ops, behavioral health and oncology, where we have nurses in those programs, and also um, cardiology, where we have nurses in those programs. So we're a pretty interactive leadership team. Yeah. We, we lead together for the most part. But that's how the org chart lines up. So what does a daily schedule look like for you in that position? (laughs) Um, Well, Dad would say it's 12 hours a day every day, but (laughs) it's not really that much. Um, And I love what I'm doing, so maybe that's why it doesn't feel like it. Yeah. Usually, um, we we start every day at 8.30 with a morning huddle, leadership Mm -hmm. huddle. And by that time, actually, the staff have started at 7 a.m. with a huddle on the units. So our leadership huddle is, is a stand-up meeting with all of our department leaders, and we go through, we try to start with something positive, um, yeah. which isn't hard um, in healthcare. There's always a good story about somebody who did something. And then we talk about any unusual events or occurrences that occurred overnight or any risk um, issues that we should follow up on. Okay. And then we get more granular um, are there patients here that are at risk for suicide or falls or elopement and what are we doing about that? How many Foley's and central lines are in today? How many devices are in and what are we doing to reduce our device usage? And then we talk about, are there any equipment or supply needs, any education needs? And then we end with an intention, uh, anything else anybody needs to communicate and then um, we end with an intention around um, the care experience and what each of us is going to do to impact the patient's experience mm-hmm. that day. So it takes about 15 minutes, and um, it's a nice way to start the day and see each other. And then after that, uh, 9 to 11 every day is, is designed for rounding. So that's um, all of our leaders' calendars are blocked from 9 to 11 every day. And if you don't block your calendar, it's not going to happen. We round on patients, we round on staff, and, and then we figure out what did we hear, what did we learn, and what should we do about it. So our rounding is not designed to, to be a gotcha kind of rounding. It's designed to be supportive because, as I said, our nurses are up there rounding on every patient every day. It's designed to just look at how have I, as the leader, configured the work here so that things are running smoothly and safely, and again, just like everything else, I don't want to be the hero. I want the bedside nurse and the director to be the hero, Mm -hmm. not me. So um, how do I support that nurse leader to be the hero for her unit? So that must be a nice way for you to still get the patient contact that you It's great. Yeah, I love it. I, I, um, it's funny, when I introduce myself to patients, I say that I'm the chief nursing officer, and I sometimes feel like people don't know really what does that mean, yeah. but I'll say I'm the head nurse here, and, and they know what that means. Yeah. And uh, I like to use rounding to understand who do, I rec- who do I need to recognize, who should we praise, and what do we need to learn about how well we're connecting with our mm-hmm. patients. And then that's followed by um, meetings. Um, we've got a lot of structured meetings 
we're on a sort of monthly meeting cycle, um, and that can go into the evenings, like today our medical executive committee meets at 6 o'clock tonight. Mm -hmm. Next Monday our board meeting um, is an evening meeting, sometimes early morning medical staff meetings. And so you mentioned earlier how you're part of an interactive team of administrators. How do you fit into that? So, um, you know, you met Jacob, our CFO, Jeff, our CEO, Mark, mm -hmm. our VP of Ops is here. We, we share, while well, we have an org chart and we have our responsibilities by unit, very little of what we do, we can do alone. <laughs> you know, we're always doing things in concert. So, you know, if we're, if we're trying to grow volume somewhere or we're trying to do a renovation somewhere, we're working together um, to get that stuff done. Um, we spend three hours a week in a leadership meeting, the five of us, with our VP of HR, Molly, working through um, operations, quality outcomes, other outcomes as a team. And then every Friday we do a calendar review to look at next week. What's going on next week? What are the meetings that we have on our plates? And how can we make sure that we're, not, um, that we're using our time well in the leadership team? And how does metrics play a role in that and how you? Um, how, we, how we operate, um, we have so much data. Um, we, are, um, we have a lot of information about how things run here as yeah. a hospital. So you saw the bed management boards, you saw the ED dashboards. Mm -hmm. We use data to learn and improve. And, we try to be balanced in the data that we capture, right? So we capture efficiency data around ED wait times and bed management. If a patient's admitted, the expectation is they're in their bed within an hour of the time the decision was made to admit yeah. them. Other metrics we track are things like time to the OR when you decide you're going to do a C-section. That should happen under an hour. So how's that, how's that going? So those are sort of operational and efficiency metrics. We also track volume metrics, you know. How are we trending? What are we projecting this month? Volumes to hit, and yeah. um, and you know what's our story around volume? Do we understand our story? And finance and and spending? Do we understand where we are in terms of our budget and where we're going to land? So that's sort of the operations and the efficiency side. And then we track things like um, our end turnover, nursing yeah. turnover, and specifically first year turnover. You know, that's a metric that is near and dear and also really critical for, I think, a CNO to look at. When you hire nurses, if they leave the organization within a year, we need to ask ourselves why that's happening. And yeah. we need to figure out how to prevent that from happening. Mm -hmm. So the, those are the HR metrics. We also look at engagement, how engaged are our staff. So a couple times a year we do this pulse survey of staff engagement. And that is another way we measure, um, do we have the right people here? Are they happy here, and, and are they engaged and aligned with our mission and vision? And then, you know, there's the, there's the how does it feel to work in this environment metric, which is important. That's why leaders round on their staff. What's working yeah. well for you today is the yeah. number one question we'll ask our, our team. So if I sit down and I, and I say, I'm going to round with you today, Sarah, I'm going to say what's working well for you today. And then we're going to proceed with, with other things and ideas you might have to improve the work environment. So for me as a nurse leader, I'm focusing more and more on how do we increase the self-governing um, structures for nurses? Yeah. How do we let nurses do the, do the leadership? Because that's what they should be doing, and we should just be supporting that. Yeah. Other metrics are... Um, because I'm still going on metrics, are um, patient experience metrics. So Prescani, Yelp. Yeah. What's the other one? Google. Yeah. Star, star ratings. What are the patients saying about their experience here? Mm -hmm. So we, we, in a nutshell, that's sort of the balanced scorecard we have. The staff metrics the outcomes and quality and operational and efficiency metrics, and they all pull together. Nice. So within your role as the CNO, what are your biggest stresses and what keeps you up at night? 
So, you know, I think like every good nurse, I drive home thinking I might have forgotten something or missing something. Mm -hmm. So I make a lot of lists and I write things down, which yep. you see me do a lot of that. Yep. I always travel with my with my book um, and I'm always making notes um, and follow up so that I can stay on my game. Uh, seriously, I don't think you could be a healthcare leader and not have accountability for building and maintaining a supportive and safe team. Yeah. So for me, it's important that we have the right leaders in place, that I'm tuned in to how, how they're doing and how their, how their staff are doing to deliver on the outcomes that we're looking for. So we talked a little bit earlier about how healthcare has changed throughout your career. Are there any um, big changes coming? <laughs> and yeah. Yeah, that's a loaded question. Um, you know, as we talked about consolidation, evolution in the, the care delivery system. So it used to be that, you know, patients got paid per click, we say, you know. Yeah. Um, now payment is, is very much tied to value and outcomes. So just because you do a lot of CAT scans doesn't mean you're going to get paid for those CAT scans. You know, are you imaging efficiently and appropriately? So I think the, the payment structure has probably been one of the biggest changes and that's been a, um, you know, that's been evolving over the last five to ten years. And pay for performance is is what it's sort of called in a nutshell. And I, I think I think it's driving quality in a positive direction. I think there's disruptive things happening on the outside that um, I don't know a lot about. But yeah. um, you know, I think we'll continue to to contribute to the changes in healthcare. Mm -hmm. When I think about what's exciting, you know, I think we talked about the way care is delivered, more urgent cares and, and sort of transactional, for lack of a better word, um, settings for people to get quick, timely care. There's changing expectations on the part of the consumer and the role that patients are going to take in managing their health. I think the whole informatics world, you're going to take informatics next semester, but I think... Um, Right? You taking clinical um, informatics? Anne's teaching a. Yeah. I don't know if information it's. Information system. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, what happens when information fro flows more freely, right, yeah. to patients? You know, they can read their records. They can, they can download an app that helps them control their blood sugars. They can, they can FaceTime a doctor. You yeah. know, that's, you know, disruptive sounds like a negative word, but it's an innovative and and disruptive thing at the same time. Yeah. And um, so those things are going to continue to happen. And we talked about already the, the pay for performance and paying for value. So talking about different types of nurses, you mentioned advanced practice nurses. What is that exactly? And do you have any at Parkland? Yeah, so advanced practice nurses are nurses with, you know, postgraduate education. There are many um, different areas of advanced practice nursing, APRNs, nurse anesthetists, midwifery, clinical yeah. nurse leaders, which was the degree that I got, yeah. clinical nurse specialists, which was a, which is an older, um, that, that's been around a long time, CNSs and CNLs. Um, we have APRNs that work in our cardiology clinic doing cardiac testing. We have APRNs that work um, in hospitalists type um, extender um, roles. We have advanced practice nurses in ER um, taking care of patients. And, you know, the state of New Hampshire is very friendly to advanced practice nurses. So mm -hmm. APRNs can, can independently practice in the state. And I think at the last count, I, I don't quote me, but upwards of, of 30 states have independent practice for nurse practitioners, which means they don't have to practice under a doctor. Yeah. So you can be an NP in New Hampshire, you can hang a shingle and have a practice. Yeah. Most hospitals, m most, most hospitals don't really honor that, so APRNs don't typically admit independently to the hospital. Hospital bylaws are sort of lagging behind, but um, they are incredibly valuable 
and contributing members of, of our care teams everywhere, oncology clinics, APRNs are seeing patients independently. And, mm -hmm. um, and again, in the hospital, it is more um, under a physician. Yeah. But um, those are bylaws changes that I foresee coming over the years. So if you could make a policy change to improve health care at the state or federal level, what would it be? Um, so for me personally, I think access to care is, a, is still an, an important priority. When I think about, not to get political here, but when I think about what happened when we expanded Medicaid and allowed more and more people to, to get care, I yeah. think that was a good thing. Yeah. Um, so um, I think... I think access to care is an important priority in preventing downstream effects that happen when you have little to no access to care. Mm -hmm. In New Hampshire, I think the impact of behavioral health bed shortages, which are being addressed now, is another issue. Those are the kind of things that I think are most important. So do you have any specific goals for the future with your career? Hmm. Well, as I said, I've been fortunate to have loved every role I was in and yeah. to have been incredibly well supported by the people around me, not to mention your dad, to pursue all these roles. Yeah. Um, staff nurse, educator, CNO. I have never regretted nursing as a career choice. I love working with staff yeah. and students. Um, I think in my doctoral work, I'm focusing on the compassion and connection that nurses share with patients and how this isn't just about being kind and compassionate. It's about um, improving care and improving outcomes for everybody. Um, maybe one day I'll teach formally. I'm taking this cognate in college teaching class, which has introduced me to, you know, how would I build a course? How would I teach people? And uh, again, it reminds me a lot of nursing. I see a lot of similarities, the passion yeah. for learning the ability to make an impact, um, the need to connect with people if you want to make them better or support them. So yep. it's been fun. So do you want to talk a little bit about your the DNP program and what made you want to do that? Is it, was it because you see yourself as a teacher? Maybe. I mean, I think the DNP program was a good um, natural next step for me. You went off to school. Um, I wanted to be back in school. Yeah. I love learning. Um, I have a very gener generous um, tuition reimbursement program here, so I was fortunate that financially it wasn't going to be a burden for us. Yeah. And, um, you know, every day in my work is an opportunity to, to, um, to bring some new knowledge and perspective. So it's helped me be a better leader to yeah. go through that program. So speaking of leadership, what would you say is your leadership philosophy? <laughs> I'm glad you asked me that. Um, it's it's funny. I it's taken me years and one one good mentor and and living it to believe it. But I have this formula that I repeat, and uh, Chris Chris occasion taught this formula to me. Number one is hire the right people. Number two is set expectations. Number three is share results, and number four is recognize and reward. So. It sounds really simple, but it pulls in, you know, being transparent about what are the goals here, being um, intentional about who you hire um, so that you get the right people here. Mm -hmm. Going back and sharing results is about saying, gee, I noticed you didn't scan that insulin. Help me understand why you're not scanning your insulin. <laughs> yeah. And, and um, what got in the way of the insulin scanning? Oh, the barcode didn't scan. Oh, okay. What do we need to do about that to fix that? Because mm -hmm. our goal is that we scan 98% of our meds. So that's an example of like being transparent, sharing results. Yeah. When Chris, when Chris gave me the formula, number four was hold people accountable. But because I'm positive, I turned that around to recognize and reward. Yeah. <laughs> so um, that's, in a nutshell, been a really successful formula for me. And you talked about hiring the right people. What do you look for when you're hiring people? So I look for people that have um, passion. You know, I think subject matter is important, um, foundational subject matter experience. But I look for passion. I look for, you know, I, I interviewed someone once 
who said, well, you know, I'm looking for, I'm looking to slow down a little bit. She was leaving a big Boston hospital, and I thought, well, you're probably not going to slow down if yeah. you come here. So I want passion. I want energy. Yeah. I look for openness to learning and honesty. Those are the things I value. Mm -hmm. I listen for examples of their leadership. One of the things that I always tell you and your friends is tell stories about how you did things. When people ask you um, questions, illustrating that with stories is really valuable. I don't know yeah. if I've done enough of that for you today, but... I think stories are powerful, and they also are good tools for people to reflect on choices they made in the moment. And, you know, one of the things that I value most about my leadership and how I got where I was is people forced me to reflect on what I did and why. Yeah. And I think that the unreflected practice is, is poor. Yeah. And I think the richness of, wow, that was pretty scary. Here's what I did. Here's why I did it. Or, hey, why did you do that? Um, help me understand what you were thinking when you gave that med. As a team, being, you know, again, starting in a teaching hospital, being able to ask questions in a way that um, was constructive and didn't put people off, and being in an environment where everyone was learning was a great way to start. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about organizational culture and how you fit into that? Yeah, so, you know, your first slide when you, in your healthcare leadership classes, the first slide you're going to get on culture is going to be some cool picture of culture eat strategy for breakfast or lunch or whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, as, as trite as that is, it is, it is true. <laughs> yeah. So I think about culture as the way stuff gets done. And when you think about culture as this big amorphous blob, it's hard to imagine as a leader how you're gonna change it. Yeah. But if you think about culture as daily habits over time, yeah. you can change culture. So a good example of that is our morning huddle mm -hmm. as a leadership team. We didn't used to do that. And in the beginning when we did it, very few people used to talk. Yeah. And so what we did, and I remember Chris, our CEO at the time saying, look, if this is really important to us, we need to be all in on it. Yeah. And having those open discussions with our leaders. This morning huddle is important. It can't just be the leaders talking. We all need to bring something to the huddle. So culture is habits over time. Um, I think a successful culture is one where there's consistency between what people say and what they do. Yeah. <laughs> and that sounds really simple, but um, sometimes there's a disconnect between what people say and what they do. And I think our employee rounding is designed to get at that. So even though you want me to do X, Y, or Z, and I can't do X, Y, or Z, I'm hearing you about that. And maybe I'll work with you to figure out how we can do it another way. Mm -hmm. And I think that's how leaders shape culture. I think communicating in a compelling way about where we're trying to go and yeah. what each person brings is probably the most, another really critical way of shaping culture. And I think I learned that back when I was doing that project on the floor at BI that, you know, you can give people information and tell them to do stuff, but if you don't really connect up with their why, yeah. you're missing a lot. Yeah. So um, that morning meeting and the huddles we have on our units are half operational and half sort of gratitude, thanks for being here. And how are you going to connect to your why today? Can you talk about a leadership lesson that you had to learn the hard way? Or something that you wish you had done differently? Yeah, you know, I thought long and hard about that one. I, I, I have a lot of... I've learned a lot of things. Um, I think in a, in a broad way, I would say not trusting myself mm -hmm. in decision-making, uh, listening to other people when I should have listened to my own decisions and my yeah. own inner voice about what was the right thing to do. You know, maybe avoiding conversations with people because I cared about them and yeah. couldn't find a way to be honest and constructive mm -hmm. and not tear them down. Yeah. So. One of the things that I think was helpful for me was to 
do the, the crucial conversations training, and I go back to that regularly. And I think there's some ethic in there, and there's some tools in there that help you as a leader be kind and hold people accountable at the same time. Yeah. And I think that's really important. Yeah. And, you know, that's what leaders need to do, in my opinion. So do you belong to any professional associations? Yeah, I do. Um, I think it's important for um, people to be involved with their, um, especially professionals, um, with their organizations. You get an understanding for context outside your hospital. So mm -hmm. like the New Hampshire Hospital Association is a good network for me of CNOs. I like to be a part of that group because... Yeah. I get to hear things that are happening outside of the world I'm typically in. The Organization of Nurse Leaders, which is um, a national organization of nurse leaders that has state um, chapters, I'm a member of that. Um, the American Nurses Association and the New Hampshire Nurses Association, I'm also a member there. I think if you want to stay connected, learn, and grow, um, and also influence the profession, right? I was never in a position where I felt like I could influence the profession, um, which is really funny because I think nurses at all levels influence the profession. But I think if, if you want to make changes, being a part of your professional organization. And then um, New Hampshire Hospice and Palliative Care Organization was an organization that I was a member of and on the board of for a long time because palliative care was near and dear to my heart, helping patients and families navigate complex illness and, mm -hmm. and end of life so so for a young person thinking about a career in health what why should they think about nursing or nurse leadership well you know I think people need to need to think about their own um, goals and and attributes and things that they like to do where their passion is where their curiosity is because I yeah. think that really fuels um, where you go how yeah. you learn. For me, nursing and healthcare offer career paths that have so many potential side paths. I am always talking to you about people that I've interviewed as doctors and nurses and others, and I'm always curious about how they got mm -hmm. where they got to. Yeah. Um, there's so many places you can go in healthcare. And so when I wasn't sure in the beginning if, nurses, if nursing was for me, I thought there's a million things within nursing that yeah. are for me. I think you have an ability to influence, ability to make a difference on the scale of the person, the family, a whole population. Nurses are the number one trusted professional in America. I think it's maybe 20 years running now by Gallup polls. I think we enjoy um, a special privileged access to patients and families when they know that you're a nurse. And it's profound. and we get changed by yeah. by the care as much as our patients get changed by the care. That's really cool. So if you had to pick one book that early careerists who aspire to be senior leaders should read, what would it be? Oh, I had a hard time with that one too. <laughs> so I remember when I was in Jean Harkless's office, um, she had stacks of books and I wanted to read every one of them. And um, you can see my bookcases are full and my our bookcases at home are full. Yeah. I love to read. I get inspiration. I get validation. Um, so I can't pick one. But I picked an article that I thought, I'll make it easy for him, read an article um, that I thought was a good um, summation of everything. And it's called The Bell Curve by um, Atul Gawande. Mm -hmm. And it's about transparency. It's about data. It's about patient-centeredness. It's about the role of leaders. And um, I think I told you I did that clinical microsystem class at Dartmouth. And I was one of a member of um, five or six people on a team. I was the nurse. There were a couple doctors. There was a critical care guy, pulmonary guy. We were so proud of the work we had done. We, um, we did a project on how to get patients into Dartmouth using um, the helicopter and yeah. how the outlying facilities could, could have a smooth transition using DART into Dartmouth. 
And so we were thrilled with the work we did. We spent a whole semester and a ton of time on it. And we presented it. There was a professor, a very esteemed professor, J. Brian Quinn, who wrote the Clinical Microsystem book. And after we gave our talk, he was in the back of the room and we asked if he had any questions. And he, um, it's so embarrassing to think of this now, but he said, you didn't tell us what a difference this made for the patients. Mm -hmm. And we were like, oh yeah, right. <laughs> um, so the bell curve is a great example of um, what that means at yeah. the patient level, all that work we do. Yeah. And in the end, it, it is all about the patients. So um, that's a good read. Do you have any advice for young people thinking about a career in healthcare? Yeah, I think, again, follow, follow what you're interested in. Notice what makes you curious. Don't be afraid to seek connections and network. Mm -hmm. um, uh, talk to people. And do you have any specific advice for students graduating from college or yeah, I, again, seek out models, seek out mentors, um, own your development. You know, openness and intellectual humility um, goes a long way. Be open, let others help you. We talked about that. Yeah. Um, seek and accept feedback. Yeah. That can be hard. Expose yourself to new learning, get comfortable being part of a team. Um, that's a big one. I think more than ever, um, our our world, our care, our outcomes are really dependent on us being able to collaborate as a team because, yeah. as I said, we're all, in, in healthcare, just like every, everywhere, we're all high performers independently and we, and, and we, we believe strongly in, in the individual work ethic, but most of what we do requires us to work well together and see things from different perspectives um, and shared goals. So that's my advice. Okay, well, thank you. It's nice talking to you about your career progression and how well, you got you. to where you are, so thank you. I enjoyed it too. Um, it's weird, I, I think we've talked over the years about my work and what I've done, but this yeah. was a nice way to, to reflect on yeah, it. Yeah, some things that I didn't know, so thank you. Thank you. You've been listening to the Health Leader Forge, a joint production of the College of Health and Human Services at the University of New Hampshire and the Northern New England Association of Healthcare Executives. Please go to our website, healthleaderforge.org, for more information or to leave comments about today's podcast. Look for Health Leader Forge podcasts on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and other podcast distribution sites. Thanks for being a part of the Health Leader Forge community and we'll talk with you again soon.